Hello, and welcome to AMFT's At Home series. My name is Amanda Darnley, and I'm the Director of Strategic Initiatives and Outreach at AAMFT. I'm thrilled to welcome you to part two of our At Home series. As a global society, we continue to navigate uncharted waters with this virus. We as individuals, partners, children, parents, friends, and therapists have had to change the way we interact and live. To support you in this process, AMFT has been hard at work. Each week, members have been taking part in our MFT virtual hangouts and connecting with peers in small groups to discuss emergent challenges for clients and themselves. Our many engagement programs have been very busy developing case consultation sessions, virtual trainings and conferences, and consumer and professional resources. On our blog and our social media, we have been releasing tips for the public, as well as advice from MFTs for working with couples, children, and families via telehealth. Things have also been extremely busy on the advocacy front. During this time, barriers for our members working in telehealth have been removed through the hard work of the AMFT family team and our state engagement programs. We also continue to work diligently to advance MFTs in Medicare, a need that is more evident than ever. In fact, just this week, the Bipartisan Policy Center's Rural Health Task Force released a report highlighting the inclusion of MFTs in Medicare as one of the chief ways to transform rural healthcare. AMFT has been working for nearly a year with this task force to gain understanding of this issue, and we are thrilled that they're giving such a clear and strong recommendation to advance this effort. I encourage you to visit our website at amft.org slash coronavirus for up to the minute news and links. And our AMFT members keep an eye on your Family Therapy e-newsletter as we launch even more resources and events to keep you connected. Today's session is being sponsored by CPH and Associates. As the endorsed professional liability insurance provider for AAMFT members, CPH and Associates is proud to sponsor the AMFT at home series. CPH provides portable occurrence form coverage that protects you throughout your professional career. During this time of evolving practices, CPH is pleased to assure you that their policy covers telehealth services as long as the services are permitted under your state's law. A policy with CPH provides peace of mind so that you can focus on your career. Get policy highlights and an instant quote online at cphins.com. Without further ado, it is now my pleasure to introduce you to today's presenter, Dr. Manishe Denishpour. Dr. Denishpour is the system-wide director and professor of marriage and family therapy at Alliant International University in California and a licensed marriage and family therapist with more than two decades of academic research and clinical experience. She has taught courses in family therapy theories, research and clinical experience, uh, family multicultural context, and has supervised students' internships both at the master and the doctoral levels. As a marriage and family therapist, she has provided numerous hours of couple and family therapy to Western families and countless therapy sessions to Eastern families. She has trained Western family therapists to provide culturally sensitive couple and family therapy to Eastern families and Easterners to provide therapy relevant to the current Western cultural context. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Danish Bohr. Greetings. <clears throat> Hope you are safe and healthy. I'm going to start my conversation about the ethics of care um, and looking at family therapists and first responders by uh, quoting Nell Nardings um, in her book, Peace Education, How We Can Come to Love and Hate War. She says, we Americans pride ourselves on our freedom to speak, to say what we believe, but of what use is it to speak if only those who already agree with us, listen. A first step to abolition of war is listening, is learning to listen with respect and sympathy. As marriage and family therapists, we are very proud of our training that, that prepares us to have both sympathy and respect for others. Today conversation, we're gonna be um, focusing on several issues that can be um, inspiring at best and emotionally charged at worst. We're gonna be talking about the ethics of care. We're gonna talk about cultural competency. And we're gonna talk about how marriage and family therapists are at a very unique position to use their relational and contextual training and help, the, help people that are needing um, our help in so many different ways these days. 
You may wonder why I talk about family therapists as first responders. Um, we are thinking of firefighters, EMTs, medical professions as people that are first responders. What we forget though, when we talk about first responders, we are talking about people that are that are that first group that gets exposed to people exposed to people's pain. And as marriage and family therapists and mental health professionals, we are the first group that are getting exposed to people's pain. We deal with, not only we deal with individual pains, we deal with couples and their relationships, we deal with families and the trauma that they are experiencing, and we are dealing with their interactions at all different levels, with society, with their community, with, with, with their school system, with work system. And so it's multidimensional, it's multi-layered, and we are dealing with, with their pain um, and, and personal and professional issues at all different levels. And so now, more than ever, we are involved with firsthand emotions and people's pain. And because we are dealing with people's fear of unknown, the more unpredictable their circumstances, the more we need to be emotionally available to them. And so when we think about um, the situation that we are in, the pandemic situation that we are in right now, um, people are coming to us with dealing with emotions, at the, at the, at the, dealing with the stress at emotional and cognitive and behavioral levels. We are seeing people uh, dealing with a cascade of stress responses. So at first we have to talk about the level of stress that people are dealing with. So when we have clients coming to us, it is very important to explain to them that we are dealing with short-term stress that is driven by fear and uh, it may arise and fade during the day and sometimes, especially at night, it becomes worse. Mm -hmm. The short-term uh, stress responders activates protective running away. And due to COVID-19, this likely translates into avoidance and anxiety as we have nowhere to run. And so it is very important to explain for clients the, uh, the impact of short-term stress that usually what happens to us because it's, it's very much fear-based, we are dealing with anxiety and uh, uh, re become very reactionary. Then we have long-term stress that now is impacting us because it has been more than a few weeks and it, be, it becoming uh, more than a month that we are in this kind of situation. So when we are dealing with long-term stress, it happened, it, 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 there is a sense of uh, loss of external locus of control. And what happens is the, an inability to foresee the future, not knowing what's going to happen with our jobs, not knowing what's going to happen with uh, our, our uh, um, housing, what's going to happen with our spouses and children in schools. There are so many unknowns and people are on, in our communities are suffering. And so what happens is with long-term stress, we usually deal with, uh, it is associated with depression and, and it's different from short-term stress. And so it impacts our memories, it impacts our, our immune system, it basically impacts our level of functioning. So it is very important to explain the difference between short-term and long-term stress. And many of us are dealing with both. That means we are dealing with lots of different kinds of anxiety, and we are also dealing with a sense of helplessness and depression. So as therapists, um, it is very important to use the ethics of care to help others and help ourselves the best way we can. The ethics of care, as I have been talking about it in the field um, for several years now, is those moral actions centered on relational, contextual, and interpersonal relationships, and also looking at caring as a virtue for family therapists. And there are three levels of caring uh, morality. One, the first one, is the self-care, is the self is cared for, in the, for the exclu to the exclusion of others. Meaning, as marriage and family therapists, we need to care for ourselves before we can care for other people. I am sure all of you have been in situations that you have not been doing well personally. 
and you have seen how that impacts your relationship with other people. And when you go to a session because you're so preoccupied with your own issues, you're not able to be emotionally present for your clients. So it takes good energy to understand that and do something about it and take care of ourselves before we take care of others. Then the second level of the ethics of care is about caring for others to the exclusion of self, meaning becoming absorbed in the needs of others. Again, I'm sure you have experienced situations that people, that you go to a session, you had a bad day, you had a fight with your spouse or your child or, or your homeworks weren't done. And then once you go to the session, you're able to put that aside and concentrate on your relationship with your clients. And you feel actually personally better once you get yourself absorbed in helping another person. And then the third layer that is very important in the ethics of care is about the moral maturity to know the needs of both self and others and understand both and care for self and also for others. Then also, um, Bill Doherty in his book on moral responsibility talks about a set of virtues for us um, in the field. Um, Nell Nodding, actually, the one that I quoted at first, talks about caring as one of the big principles that we use in ethics of care and as a virtue for, for therapists. And that means being absorbed in others. It should be a principle mandate for therapists to have this idea of caring for others very, very important. Identifying with other people's needs and goals being naturally caring and also ethically caring, that you have to be able to understand both being and being natural at caring for others, and then th thinking about the sense of morality that comes into the ethics of caring for other people and which requires self-care. So the first one is caring for others, the best and the most important virtue for therapists. I'm hoping that we are doing, we, are, we have become healers, and helpers because we care for other people deeply. The second one is courage, which is very important for a therapist to have the courage to be firm uh, in spirit in the face of danger. Think about a suicidal client that you are helping you do an assessment, you need to keep the person safe, you want to keep your license, you don't want this person to uh, do anything uh, that, that will harm him, and also show that you weren't able to keep him safe. So that takes a lot of courage. You are doing the right thing at the same time that you are very afraid. It's a sense of self-exploration that, that we have to have the courage that when people are challenging us and saying you didn't do it right, sometimes clients challenge us and say what you said, what you talked about really didn't, didn't help me. We have to be able to self-explore and be able to talk to people about that and uh, uh, really self-examine ourselves and our skills and see what is it that we need to be doing differently. It takes courage to take on colleagues, our bosses, our institutions when it comes to cultural competencies, when it comes to lack of justice, when it comes to lack of care. The, the courage to uh, challenge clients in a session. Imagine working um, with an individual talking about family members in an unfair way and you want to challenge the person and say, how do you contribute to the situations that you are dealing with in your family? Imagine thinking about working with couples and the fights and the disagreements they have in the session, and you have to be able to process that and have the courage to challenge the spouse, one of them, and say, you are wrong, and you need to be work working on your behavior toward your um, uh, significant others. Think about a family situation that you're working with a, with a mom and a dad and, and several teenagers, and they are challenging each other. They are not being fair. They're putting each other down, you have to have the courage to actually challenge the person and challenge the situation. Um, I'm currently working with a, um, 
actually an executive director of a very large company that is dealing with um, some anxiety. We have we have, have we have a, a long term relationship, but due to um, the circumstances we are dealing with right now, due to COVID nineteen, um, he has purchased many guns um, and is so afraid that people are going to come to his um, place of residence and steal food or um, try to harm him in, in many different ways. And so while we have to have a lot of empathy for his, where he's coming from um, and, and validating um, his fear to begin with, then we um, talked about how, what his fear is based on and in, in how can he actually use that to help different communities because he has resources, he has money. And so instead of, he can buy guns if that makes him feel safe, but he also has to be thinking about what ways he can use his money to help people that have not, don't have resources and perhaps he's afraid that they're gonna to come to his house and take food and, and harm him in some ways. And so we came up with ways that he can actually buy food and, and donate it to places that are giving people um, uh, free food um, so they don't have to come to his neighborhood and they don't have to attack him. We also, I also had to um, challenge him about the, uh, the idea that he um, grew up in a family that the uh, 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 mother uh, was married to this, uh, this man that was very emotionally and physically abusive. And so he had no sense of control growing up in terms of his relationship with people, his relationship with the word, he felt that nobody is protecting him. And so buying guns, as much as I'm against buying guns, I had to actually challenge him and talk about and, and wondering with him that buying guns was a, is a way for him to protect himself because he thinks that nobody else will. And so making him staying with him in that process and actually um, being having the guts to challenge him with that and in kind of trying to um, stay with um, his thinking process, his emotional process, and helping him and having the courage to actually challenge him with his, with his belief system. And so if the first virtue is caring and the second virtue is courage, the third one is actually prudence, the wisdom, the good judgment that we should have as a therapist, the good timing. I can challenge him because I have been working with him way prior to the challenge that we are dealing with right now. So he's able to, he has a relationship with me um, that he can actually hear that from me. He uh, jokes about as a conservative um, man, it, he wonders why he listens to this Muslim chick who has been helping him um, throughout the years um, in, in different kinds of situations that he has been dealing with. And so having the wisdom to know when to pace, when to lead, when to challenge someone, calibrating those challenges, having patience with people, knowing and accepting people's limitations of change, just because we have ideas about how people change. In, in graduate school, we teach a lot of you about how to uh, use different models, how to challenge people, how to um, balance your relationship with different family members. But when you sit in front of clients, you actually have to have the patience to accept the limitations of change, knowing that this is how much you can challenge someone when it comes to those kinds of issues. And also common sense recommendations, know how to help people um, in different kinds of situations. So virtues of caring, courage, and prudence should help you help clients in using ethics of care as a background could be very helpful to you providing services. We also have to be thinking about um, core moral issues that we are dealing with in psychotherapy. We are dealing with people who are 100% of the time come to us because they are dealing with some unfairnesses. They are dealing with spouses being unfair. They're dealing with their boss being unfair. They're dealing with siblings, parents being unfair. So there are always conversations about lack of fairness. And so the core moral issues in psychotherapy becomes about justice justice to people around us. And so as marriage and family therapists, because we are relational, our training has been relational and contextual, 
even if you are working with one family member. It makes sense to talk about the justice toward even excess spouses, parents that have passed away, people that they have no longer have a relationship with. I was working with a woman um, a few years ago, actually about 15 years ago, that um, he, uh, she found out that her husband is, is cheating on her and um, decided to leave in, 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 uh, with the child and go from one state to the other. Uh, her husband uh, broke his leg and was um, homebound, basically. And she decided to, because she was so mad at him, she decided to disconnect electricity because it was under her name, knowing that he's not able to move, he's not able to care for himself, and he's going to be in, in, a, in a house that is pitch black, basically, all by himself. He was telling me this story, she was telling me this story five years into it, um, after that, and she was saying how mad she was and how upset she was. And I was telling her that, that it, I can understand that you'll be mad at your spouse for um, uh, cheating on you. That very much understandable, a lot of pain involved. But disconnecting electricity when you know your spouse uh, cannot move around the house is unfair. And that is something that we have to be thinking about as we are providing relational and contextual therapy for people. So just because we are working with a client doesn't mean that their perspectives should be the only perspective that we take into consideration. And so we have to be thinking about justice to ex-spouses, to children and parents, to feminism, to justice in marriage. Uh, that there are times that people are unfair to their uh, spouses just because they're not in the therapy room doesn't mean that we shouldn't take that on and challenge our uh, client that we are working with when it comes to those kind of things. Also justice in terms of the global community, how responsible we are toward others um, in different communities. Right now we are hearing people saying, uh, protesting in different places and saying, I want to have my freedom. I don't care if I, if I get sick with Corona. What they're not realizing is that we are not talking about them. There are so many unknowns about this, this disease anyways. But what we know is that you can be a carrier without being sick. So we are talking about other people that will pay the consequences of our decision. It's like we are talking about people that do not vaccinate their children and they say it's a personal choice. Actually, I was reading an article that was saying we have become so individualistic in terms of our perspectives about everything that we say, I don't want my child to be vaccinated. Not thinking about how many people, how many vulnerable people, how many cancer patients, how many people that their, their immune system are um, uh, compromised can suffer the consequences of one parent, one set of parents not caring about other people. And so these are the issues that we can take on in the therapy room and talk about a global community, even the small community that we are part of. Also, um, Bill Doherty in, in, in his book talks about how we are um, citizens uh, of, of our country. As clients, we are citizens, and as therapists, we are citizens, and we are, we are part of our communities. And therapy is public work. It's not private, even though we, de we deal with people's deepest, darkest secrets, even though we are sitting with them in one room, and talking to them about what's happening in their families does not mean that we shouldn't be taking on on bigger macro level issues and give them information. So when people are talking about other people being unfair, we can take it at that level and talk about advocate for the other persons. Of course, having the prudence to know when to do that, the timing is very important, but also taking on people, taking on ourselves as public workers, remember, first responders, and taking on our clients as being part of the public community. And so the, um, uh, we, when we understand the ethics of care and comfortable with the uh, caring virtues that we just talked about, we can use them in therapy very well. Because morality is created in everyday life 
through our social interactions and conversations we have with people. So as therapists, we can bring those conversations into the therapy room and talk about our clients' moral responsibilities. Either way, um, it, when, when people are, are coming to us um, right now after the crisis that, that, that we are in, and always, but right now more than ever, they're very fearful. And because they're fearful, as we talked about, short-term stress creates anxiety, long-term stress creates and, and, and makes us depressed. But that short-term anxiety creates so much because it's so fear-based, brings out all the biases and prejudices in us. You are hearing people talking about there is there has been a surge in racial and ethnic biases all over again. It always existed. Now there is a shift into um, uh, being biased toward a different group of people, calling it Chinese virus, talking about uh, uh, unsanitary, arguably backward practices, talking about uh, these wet markets, even though we um, have so much to learn the actual causes of the coronavirus has not yet been officially determined by the scientific community. And yet people continue to perpetuate a horrible misrepresentation of 1.4 billion people. And because Asians um, have the, the physical um, statures, it's the same. A lot of people are suffering the consequences of prejudice just because they look Asian. Uh, one of our students in one of our campuses was um, uh, walking her dog and she's not even from China. And, and somebody was very upset with her and told her that she needs to go back to China and stay there and talked about how uncivilized and backward they are. If we wanna do that, you have to think about it, bring it home and see, can we judge NFL because Michael Wick uh, love the dog fighting and say that NFL is a dog fighting, uh, 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 uses dog fighting practices. Can we talk about those Americans that eat bull testicles, alligator tails, wild boar, a lobster? Uh, you go to a restaurant, you have a, a, an animal that is, uh, is alive, and then you choose that animal and then you have the chef take it and put it in a bit boiling water and bring it for you and eat it. Why don't we talk about those kinds of practices? Because we are so used to it, because that's part of what we do. And so it's not a strange, just because we are familiar with it. And we are not familiar with other practices in other places. And so people are judging others based on the unknowns and because of the fear and anxiety that they are dealing with right now. For example, mad cow disease uh, originated in the UK and it was because of yes, some people ate a uh, cow's brain, part of it. Many cows actually suffered from the consequences, but we don't call it the British virus. Let's think about H1N1. It, it emerged in Northern America, uh, transmitted uh, from pigs. Many cultures think, think of pigs as dairy animals, something that you should not be eating. Why don't we call it North American flu when we know that between 2009 and 2010, there were about um, uh, 60.8 million H1N1 cases. Just in America, 12,000 people died and globally between 150,000 and 575,000 uh, people died from H1N1. But we don't call it North America virus. We don't know enough in terms of science to know that these are the causes. Now we know that there have been cases in California and other places that were way before we knew anything about Wuhan and China and any of any of those situations. So we have all kinds of conspiracy theories about who started it, if this is biological welfare, America started it, uh, China started it, who's doing what to whom, without really looking at it doesn't matter what it is, we are dealing with the consequences of a pandemic and we need to keep ourselves and our family members safe.
So that's at the, at the macro level that you can actually talk about as part of your ethics of care, as part of your virtue of caring, courage, and prudence in the therapy session, because I am sure every session is going to be about these issues and put people's mind at ease and challenge them when you can, that, they, that these prejudices, it's not helpful even to our own health. Then at micro level, what's happening in, in our societies is, is once again, we see race as a social determinant of health. Many people talk about this disease does not discriminate, but our responses to this pandemic, our healthcare system has been discriminating. We say it doesn't discriminate, but if you can do social distancing in a big home that has several rooms, you are safer than, than people that are living in very close quarters and they cannot avoid each other. It seems like racism is a matter of life and death in this country. Even before the coronavirus pandemic, racial inequalities in health, education, housing, employment have shaped our lives um, and, and different people uh, from cradle to grave. This pandemic though is bringing the harsh realities of these long standing inequalities into sharp focus, making it clear that why race should be viewed as a social determinant of health. So with the pattern we are seeing, we are seeing now, now everybody's talking about it from the president down, that disproportionately higher number of minority deaths are happening due to the coronavirus. So in unemployment, in, in employment terms, um, ethnic minorities in US are already more likely to work in insecure, low paid work and more likely to be unemployed. In housing, they represent more than half of all overcrowded households, are less likely to own their home, and have up to 11 times less green space to access. They represent about more than one quarter of all public transit users. Blacks and Hispanics are also less likely to have equal access to healthcare systems. Hospitals are not built in their neighborhoods. Pharmacies do not have the same level of resources and they, 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 they have to wait more than other people to get their medication. So this conversation about they don't care for themselves and they don't know how to care for themselves, they uh, do not care for themselves, is because healthcare system and healthcare resources are criminally inadequate in their neighborhoods. Unfortunately though, what do we hear? Uh, we hear biological, we hear cultural explanations. Our attorney general in this, of this country is an African-American man. And he's, when they ask him why African-Americans are dying disproportionately, he says, well, because of the pre-existing uh, conditions and the use of alcohol and drugs. So instead of talking about social and economic inequalities faced by ethnic minorities, we are talking about things that that as just blaming the victim, telling that they're responsible for this. Not only we see the, the uh, uh, lack of access uh, for, for people, we also see a criminalization of uh, the, the people that are uh, uh, covering themselves, wearing masks. Um, we have seen a surge of black men um, being uh, reported and you know, being followed in the stores because they, they are wearing a mask and, and basically, basically protecting themselves. In Baltimore, a police surgeon, uh, sergeant actually uh, is under investigation because he openly coughed on a black resident while patrolling their community. The chief of police said that not only this is just kind of uh, uh, disgusting basically, but it is mind boggling. Why would someone do that to another human being in the middle of all of this? The other issue that ethnic minorities are greatly suffering is the racial bias in the medical treatment and, and the racial empathy gap that, we are, that they receive when it comes to pain tolerance. 
the um, Professor uh, uh, um, William, uh, David Williams at Harvard is a public health professor talks about the research study that I believe Stanford did, that they uh, train actors to go to hospitals from different ethnic backgrounds and say that they have broken arm and they are in great pain. They had African-American men, African-American women, they had Hispanics, they had whites, go to different hospitals. They repeated this 700 times in different hospitals and ask for help. And the fact that the African-American men repeatedly were not believed that they're in pain and the level of medical attention to them was so incredibly different from other people. And of course, white men and women were at the top of getting help when it came to their pain. Right now, we are seeing the same thing. We are seeing hospitals sending minorities at a higher proportion home and say you can you can go home and rest and take care of yourself as opposed to the majority of people going to the hospital people that have more resources people that have better insurance get better help they get treated differently even within the medical system even though the level of pain is the same we have seen the physician patient interactions but that we have seen with black patients they're mostly being spoken to as opposed to listened to we saw that in the, in, uh, the French doctors uh, right now talking in France about uh, using, potentially uh, using the vaccination on uh, being tested on poor Africans that live in France. And in, you wonder why um, there is this healthy paranoia in different communities when it comes to the healthcare system. United States and European nations have a long and torrid colonial legacy of using blacks for different kinds of uh, experimentations. And, and, and so um, we uh, uh, see um, all these different layers of issues. We have people's fears and anxiety about where this kind of virus has come from. We have people uh, being treated differently within the hospital and within the different kinds of uh, 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 healthcare systems. We see people suffering the consequences of lack of access to good housing. We see people that uh, somebody was saying that if the economy is booming in this country, why is it that 80% of people after not receiving two paychecks are really suffering the consequences of not having access to uh, money and working? Um, it's interesting that we, you see um, all these people uh, protesting about their freedom and wanting to be outside and, and not um, suffer the consequences of social distancing and staying home. But you don't see the same group of people protesting about the green space for uh, poor people. You don't see them go out there and say minimum wage is not enough. You don't see people talk about these essential workers that are out there and delivering groceries and, 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 and going to uh, uh, nursing homes and cleaning and, and, and working them. We need to be seeing, we need to be talking about those issues with, with our clients. And so when people come to us and they're stressed and fearful, the first line of response that they can have is caring for others. If you can encourage people to care for others, when I told you the story about the guy with 41 guns and having him actually buy food instead of guns and deliver it to local grocery stores and places that have food shelters for people, he actually felt better about the situation because he put aside his own fear and was able to be available, emotionally available, do something for the communities, for, for his community, for people in different neighborhood. And so what we know is, is looking at caring for others can be very helpful. I was working with a, as you know, many people with symptoms of OCD 
are really suffering um, right now because of all the uh, uh, germ phobia and the, and the use of uh, uh, cleaning supplies. Um, but I'm, I'm working with a woman that her husband is really suffering um, and had severe OCD um, to begin with before all of these happens. And now it has exasperated. Um, and as we know, what we know about OCD is that it starts or it gets um, activated by lack of control. And when people don't have control over issues in their lives, they actually uh, become controlling of themselves. So if I can have control over washing something over and over again, then I can feel some control over something. And even though that will, other people will suffer the consequences. So her husband um, has severe OCD. We actually had to talk about um, how his OCD started, had nothing to do with her and their relationship. He was madly in love with the woman. And um, that woman abruptly, uh, they were engaged, abruptly broke engagement and did not give him any good explanations for why she's ending the relationship. So that day he came home with clothes, all fully clothed, shoes and everything, took a shower because he was so devastated. And from that day on, he became extremely OCD. And after the situation, after, after the coronavirus pandemic, he actually become, became really, really bad. So she said that what he does, he's, he's a professor. He, she says that he's in a bedroom, I'm in the kitchen cooking. He hears that I am closing a, um, one of the cabinet doors. From the bedroom, he yells, did you, honey, did you wash, wash your hands before touching the cabinet knob? And she says, I get very, very upset with him. And so I say, no, I didn't start yelling, arguing. Then she said, it gets to the point that he starts crying and saying, please tell me that you did wash your hand before touching the cabinet. And so she said, my family is telling me that I need to leave him. This is very torturous. She says, my friends, my coworkers, everybody says that this is really out of control and you should leave him. Now it's in the middle of the pandemic, so there is nowhere to go. They both work from home and they have to, she says, I have to deal with his behavior now seems like 24 seven. So she was telling me that uh, this is a story about him and in how miserable she is because of his behavior. And so we started talking about how miserable he is in terms of his symptoms being exasperated by the situation. And so let's think about him and care for him in terms of how devastated he is seeing people and their behavior in this kind of situation and, and being upset about any germs are going to be um, attacking him personally and his life is over. And so instead of getting upset with him, why don't you go to the bedroom and tell him about, I'm so sorry that you are so, feel so out of control that these things are impacting you. And so that's an example of caring for another person. So she can actually manage being with him in that household until the uh, situation is, has been resolved. And so one of the issues that are very important um, in terms of stress and stress responses is the nervous system loves a sense of control more than even more than ever awareness this is this is very interesting that that we do um care about um the, the, the having a sense of control more than having awareness so that's why we are having such a hard time in different communities with having a sense of control as opposed to awareness so what is the best place to talk to people and give them information and help them understand what's happening around them is the therapy room. So you want to have people have better sense of control, you need to be start talking about 
these kinds of caring for other people. We all know that oxytocin gets released when we care about other peoples and other communities. It, that, that activates bonding and good feel, feeling chemicals for people. So now is the time for us to use our social advocacy the way that we can justify, uh, we can actually use uh, social advocacy and, and talk to people about family members, not even clients. Talk about um, at the macro level, what's happening globally, the blame game that is going on, all the conspiracy theories at that level, and then do something about different communities of color that are really suffering during this, this time and, and really having a hard time with uh, dealing with these issues. We all know that racial inequality was baked into the recipe of the creation of the United States of America. We have been denying this and stating that minorities are alcoholics, abusers, violent, uncivilized, uneducated. But the truth is staring at us in the eye, begging us to think differently. As marriage and family therapists, we have a lot of responsibilities. The ethic of care tells us that we have to take these issues very, very seriously and use the ethic of care of caring, courage, and prudence and help our clients the best way possible so they can be in different, different places they can be using these relational and systemic thinkings that we have been trained for, trained for and fight wholeheartedly when it comes to racial and ethnic inequalities. No longer we can deny these um, inequalities. As marriage and family therapists, we have been trained to look at multi-generational issues in families. We have been trained to look at a genogram and see that what happens in the, in the previous generation is going to repeat itself. And yet, when it comes to the legacy of slavery, when it comes to the legacy of the genocide of, of Native Americans in this country, we somehow tend to deny that. How could we do that as marriage and family therapists when we know the intergenerational transmissions of these pain and suffering and lack of resources? And so the multicultural competency that we talk about and we go to trainings and we have we teach classes is meaningless if we're not really looking at the issues that people are dealing with at multiple levels in so many different places. And so I'm going to um, end uh, my conversation with a quote from Carol Gilligan. In, his, in her book, the Dif A Different Voice, she talks about both love and democracy depend on voice. We need to be the voice of voiceless and advocate for those who cannot protect and advocate for themselves. We have a lot of power in the therapy room. You know how much power you have because of, of the way the protecting and, and, and um, uh, healing makes sense in the therapy room. So we need to use it well. Remember, we talked about care for the self to the exclusion of the other. You need to care for yourself. You need to look at all your relationships with people around you in your family and see how you can be focused on what you need first in order to provide services for others. I've been hearing from people that sessions are more exhausting. If they used to do eight sessions a day, they cannot do more, more than four and five because we have, all of us are dealing with the same issue. So it becomes very exhausting to deal with all of that at the same time become available to others. So care for the self to the exclusion of others, care for others to the exclusion of, of, of yourself. And so once you feel that you are in a better place, then you need to be concentrating on caring for others. And that includes 
caring for justice and advocating for those that are voiceless. It is your responsibility in the therapy room to be talk to talk about these issues, even it's, if it seems like you're going to be concentrating on, on, on the relationship, these issues are going to be coming up you need to talk about them. In working with minorities, you need to validate and empathize with what they are dealing with. Even within this pandemic situation, they have to have extra layers of issues put on them. And so once you are in a better place, try to care for others in, in, to the exclusion of yourself. And then, as we talked about with high level of moral maturity, care for self and others, and stand up for justice become part of the same dynamic. I'm hoping that as marriage and family therapists, we continue to see ourselves uniquely positioned in the field of mental health, see ourselves as people that have been trained relationally and contextually, so we can help our clients our families, our communities, and the global community to do better and come together and take care of each other. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ganeshpour. I think we're all just beginning to understand the impacts of this pandemic, and I think you've given us a lot to think about today. Thank you. I also want to thank our sponsors again for this session, uh, CPH and Associates. I hope you all have enjoyed today, and if you're interested in attending in a future session, don't forget to RSVP at amft.org slash at home. Next week's session will feature Dr. Michael Yapko, and we will soon be announcing the final three sessions as well. Thank you all, and we look forward to seeing you next week at home.